May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Ten days ago, I went to Ely Cathedral to preach. Now, Ely Cathedral is a place that makes a landscape. It changes the scenery. If you've seen the building, it shifts your mood. It was built on what was once an island, a place in a shifting bed of reeds, a lost place. Now, the cathedral is visible for miles around, rising out of the fens as though it's going to go on rising forever. It's a great, grand, raw-boned building, and it tells any believer who walks inside that you are dwarfed by glory. It's a wonderful place, but it has more to it than that for me, because it's the cathedral in which I was ordained priest. So Ely is memory to me, it's association, it ties me to my past, it roots me into faith. Place really matters. The place you call home, the hills you grew up with, the places where you came to believe. In scripture, places matter a huge amount. The Old Testament keeps telling us that God is met in places and that places hold a memory a burning bush, Mount Sinai, Bethel. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The ministry of Christ is a mission of preaching and teaching. It's a lot of words, but it's also an itinerary of places, names and references to vineyards and fields and hillsides and the sea. So faith is Bethlehem and Jerusalem, Golgotha, it's Rome, Assisi, Canterbury, Westminster. The places matter because they are memory and character. Make no mistake, Christian faith is not just an idea, it's not an aspiration. Christian faith is character and character always has time and place. And character and time and place are the only way that you can tell the story of Manchi Masamola. We have to identify a time and a place. She's the youngest of our modern martyrs and her place is now second from the left above the Great West door. It's a very good place to be, but her home is in what is now South Africa. It's in the northern Transvaal, north and east of Pretoria and it's there that she died in 1928. Maji Masamola belonged to an ethnic group called the Pedi. Once, this very ancient people controlled great swathes of the Northern Transvaal under the leadership of a paramount chief. Boer trekkers and the British Army changed all that. It's a long, familiar and very depressing story of colonial settlement that drove the Pedi people back into the hill country, land that was less fertile, land that was prone to drought. Worse, the Pedi, who had an inclination to try and live in peace with their neighbours, tried to reach accommodation with all those early settlers. They made agreements with them, gave them space. The trouble was that the Pedi had no sense that anyone could own land. Land was clearly there for everyone to share, wasn't it? So they were baffled. Then they were dismayed, and then they were very angry to discover that the settlers thought that they had arrived and settled as kings and queens. So petty sovereignty was lost, the land was lost, and all their dignity was lost. Then the British began to tax the people whose livelihoods and whose country they had just stolen. Money could only be made by leaving the homelands altogether, and by going to work for white bosses in the mining industry. So that's where most of the young men went. Some of them leaving for good and becoming urban and very strange to their parents. I hope you're beginning to get a picture. This is a story in which home and ownership and who belongs and who is foreign is absolutely the key to what is going on. So when white missionaries arrived in the Northern Transvaal with the gospel, they were stepping into really difficult country. These missionaries brought medicine and new skills. 
So to some extent, they were very welcome. But they were also foreigners, and it seemed to the Peddy that they belonged to another race whose aim appeared to, be dis to destroy the very communities that they claimed to be serving. So individuals might turn to Christ, but whole communities were really resistant to the gospel. And people who were converted, petty Christians, found that their neighbors started to call them heathens or call them foreigners. To become Christian was to accept another identity that made you an alien in your own village, made you an alien to your own family. And it's here and in this time that Manchi Masamola converted to the Christian faith. We know precious little about her. We're not even sure of the date of her birth. Usually, it's suggested that she was born in 1913. Aged about 13, she was taken by a cousin to the settlement at Marishane to hear a missionary preach. She was impressed, and she asked her mother for permission to go more regularly to hear this preacher. And that was the beginning of a long and then very bitter struggle with her family. Her parents had traditional and local beliefs. To begin with, they fended off Christian influence by making their daughter commit to the traditional local initiation school for young women. So right from the start for her, she experienced Christian allegiance as a contest between cultures. It's this or it's that, you have to choose. To adopt a new faith was really to make yourself foreign. She was also engaged to a young man, one of those migrant workers, and she was told to wait for him to return to the village to make a decision. She refused, and so she was treated as disobedient. And that started a cycle of violence. She was argued with, she was beaten, she was forced to drink a tribal remedy when it was meant to heal her. And still she kept going to hear the preacher. Manche was made of stern stuff, that much is really clear. She wasn't deterred by the ill treatment. In fact, if anything, it strengthened her commitment. Very few of her words, anything that she said, survives. But the preacher, Mary Shane, reported later that she spoke about being baptized in her own blood, a better baptism, she called it. She really believed that her faith would lead to her death. She said, if they cut off my head, I will never leave my faith. Soon, permission to travel to Mary Shane was refused, but she continued to pray morning and night. And then finally, on or about the 4th of February, 1928, her parents took her beyond the limits of the village and beat her very brutally. The young girl dragged herself away into the bush and died alone, propped up against a stone. In a bizarre sequel, her parents then attempted to bury her in the village cemetery, but in what was usually soft earth, they hit rock, and they tried again and again, and they kept hitting rock. She wasn't going to be theirs or belong to the village, even in death. So Manche was interred back on the distant hill where she died. She's still there. The old hostilities battled on in the mission at Marishane. A memory of faith and courage persisted, and pilgrims began to make her way to the grave. Remarkably, her mother, who was defiant for a very long time, urgently warning people that Christians were dangerous, was herself finally converted and baptized. She made a first communion in 1969. There's a picture of her. Was that a reconciliation of a sort? I can't tell you because a heavy silence falls around the family, around that brutal, lonely death. So what words do we find for this modern martyr? Working on this sermon, I looked at the Church of South Africa's website and I found a flyer for the annual pilgrimage to her grave. And the picture that they used was of our statue on the front of the abbey. So our commemoration now shapes the story of this resolute young woman. She was a stranger in her family, stranger in her village. She's certainly a stranger to us. 
and yet her story and ours now start to grow together. I think there are probably two things to keep in mind. First of all, there's her otherness, her difference, a place and a time so different from this, and that bright, brittle, unusual courage. The saints are other. They're not like us. To manage that strangeness, we tame them with descriptions and catalogues. There are types of sanctity. There are even types of royal sanctity into which we can slot our own St. Edward. Some were crowned again by martyrdom. Others chose exile from their homeland. Yet others reigned with justice and holiness. Among them, King Edward shone like the morning star in a cloudy sky. Lists of the way that the saints do unusual things. The epistle to the Hebrews knows that trick, naming the distinct and different virtues. They were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. The saints as other. In that place and that time, Manche Massimola is a witness to a faith that can be brave and really startling, a candle in the dark, a witness against prejudice and violence, something rare and unusual. Yet the other thing to remember is she's just a little girl, 15, a friend to some, a daughter. She's us, all of us. Her story and ours are not in fact so very different and the stories grow together. And that's what the saints do for us. They show us the faith that is ours, utterly human, familiar. And they show us how courage and faith and holiness can make us strange. Amen.